Okay, so DNA, one of the reasons that DNA is so uh, powerful is that it actually serves as a template for replicating new strands. Uh, and we saw this in the previous chapter when we learned about complementarity. So um, a DNA strand, a single strand of DNA, uh, determines the, uh, the, the sequence of the strand that can bind us, and that's because of the complementarity of the, of the base pairs. So the arrangement and the nature of the nitrogenous bases allows DNA strands to serve as templates for creating new strands of DNA. Uh, one thing to remember is that this process is not passive, so this, this, uh, the process of DNA repl replication requires multiple factors, and these are enzymes that are encoded by genes. And it also requires energy to assemble new strands. So DNA serves as a template for replicating new strands, and here we see a double-stranded piece of DNA that is being unwound. So this DNA is unwound um, into two single strands, and you see that the hydrogen bonds that hold the DNA strands together are breaking apart. So this A and T, this T and A, normally would have hydrogen bonds, um, but in some way we've managed to separate those two strands. And so here we can see the generation of new strands coming in, and these are complementary to the, to, the, to the old strand. So we have a C that binds to the G, T, A, etc. And so eventually, if this strand continues, then of course you'd have a C here, an A here, and a T here. So one of the first things that people were interested in, researchers were interested in, is understanding the nature of how this replication occurred. And they came up with three different models. So one model is called semi-conservative, one model is called conservative, and one model is called dispersive. And so each of these different models would result in the in, the, in a difference for where the old DNA and new DNA is incorporated. And it's easiest just to look at this visually to see the three different processes. So conservative is shown on the left, semi-conservative in the middle, and dispersive on the right. And so initially you have strands, a single double-stranded piece of DNA, and we're going to designate the old and the new strands by the color. So the old strand are red, and then the new strands that get generated by DNA replication are going to be in blue. And so in the first case, conservative replication, the old strands stay together. So somehow these two strands are able to replicate, uh, but after this replication occurs, the old strands come together and keep a, a double-stranded piece of DNA. Whereas both of the new strands come together, and the new strands come together, um, and so you have a piece of double-stranded DNA that's both um, from the new round of replication. And you can contrast this with semi-conservative. So semi-conservative is where each of the strands has one piece of the old DNA. Um, so the old TNA is here. And then here is the second strand. So sometimes we, we distinguish between these strands is the Watson and the Crick strand. So in this case, both the Watson and the Crick strand, both the, the old Watson and the Crick strand are together in double-stranded piece of DNA. And then in this case, the Watson strand goes with one, and the Crick strand goes with the other. And then the final is dispersive, and so they just, this just means that um, the strands are broken up, and so um, you have different pieces together. So here you can see that initially this single strand starts as the new piece, but then it's uh, covalently bond to part of the old piece before it goes back to the new piece, etc. And so this would be kind of a random process where this all, all is glued together. So these are the three models, conservative, semi-conservative, and, and dispersive. And the answer for how things work is semi-conservative. So you need to remember that, uh, that DNA replication actually occurs semi-conservatively. And we'll go over a couple of the experiments that demonstrated this. So the first one is Messelson and Stahl, which in 1958 addressed this. And again, they use radioactivity to address this question. And so they could do that because there are two different versions of nitrogen. There's uh, 15N and 14N. Um, one of these is, uh, is radioactive, so that means that the extra neutron will decay and cause um, a, release, a release of a particle that can be recognized by, let's say, a Geiger counter or something like that. Um, but for this experiment, they actually relied on the fact that these weigh different so because of the extra neutron, 
um, the differences in the number of neutrons, um, there's actually a subtle difference in, in the weight of the DNA that's created using 15N versus 14N. And so the weight difference in strands could be separated by a process known as centrifugation. And this first provided strong evidence that DNA is semi-conservative in prokaryotes. So how do they do this? So initially they, they grew the cells in 15N labeled medium. And so that means all of the DNA that, that is produced um, incorporates this 15N nitrogen into the DNA. So DNA is uniformly labeled with 15N. And then at generation zero, uh, they switch the media. So the way they would do that is they would spin down the bacterial cells, and then they would add new media that instead of containing 15N, now contain 14N. And so the bacteria bring that nitrogen into the intercellular space, and that's what they use now in order to create nucleotides. And so now the nucleotides go from being 15N to 14N. And so you allow the cells to replicate once. So this is typically by timing. So if you waited um, 20 minutes or 40 minutes, which is how long it takes to replicate DNA, at the end, um, you've had one additional strand of DNA generated. You can also allow that to go again. So that's generation two, where you've allowed cells to replicate an additional time. And then finally, you can allow cells to replicate a third time. And so in all three of these cases, it's within um, the same media of 14N. So in initially, you have you know, 1X, however many bacteria are here. Now you've gone to 2X, 4X, and then 8X in terms of the number of cells. So they take these cells, they lyse them, and they extract DNA from them. And so now we have the sample of DNA that came from this. And then they put this in a tube and then they use a centrifuge. So a centrifuge is just a, um, so is a machine that spins very rapidly. And so it creates a very strong force, centri centrifugal force um, on the media. And so this will actually drag the DNA down the tube to a certain place. And how far it travels is dependent upon the weight of the DNA. And so this is just a characteristic band of anything that was composed of 15N, 15N. So it basically goes to this point right here. So now they allow DNA replication to occur. And so now, instead of having a band here, they have a band that's a little bit higher up and that is characteristic of 15N, 14N. So that's, that's characteristic of when DNA strands have um, one strand being composed of 15N and one strand being composed of the 14N nitrogen. Again, they allow this generation to go, so another round of replication occurs, and so now they see a band at 15N, 14N, and now a new band at, that, that is even, that is even uh, lower weight which they characterize as 14N, 14N. And they allow this to happen again, and so this band becomes a little bit weaker, and then you're left with more 14N, 14N. So how does this make sense? So this makes sense if you think about things in a, in a semi-conservative process. So in this case, um, initially you have the cells that only grow in 15N, and so the gravi gravitational force and the centr centrifugal force um, brings the DNA down to about this region. Now you have semi-conservative DNA replication, so now each double-stranded piece of DNA has a little bit of 14, one strand of 14, and one strand of 15. And so this strand weighs a little bit less, and so when you, when you put it through centrifugation, it doesn't travel as far. But because all of these strands are identical, you only have a single band. Now you allow this to happen again. And so, um, you know, this strand, this red strand right here, this goes to here, this blue strand right here goes to here, and then you also replicated two additional single strands of the 14N. Same thing with here, this red strand goes to here, this blue strand goes to here, and then again you replicate two new 14Ns. And so now we have two different populations one that's the 15N, 14N, which is this right here. So these guys right here, 
uh, what corresponds to this band. And now you also have two right here. So there's a mastering genetics homework um, that helps you hopefully understand this process and why if these other um, types of processes were true, you would not, you would not expect to see um, this set of, of bands and in the centrifugation. So if this was conservative, for example, um, you would never lose this band right here. Um, and that's because you would always have this, since in conservative replication, the old DNA always associates it with itself, and so you'd never be able to create this hybrid DNA molecule. And then dispersive would have a different relationship um, where you wouldn't have this 14N14N band. Another way that people have looked at this was in eukaryotes. Um, so this is the Taylor Woods Hughes experiment, um, and they looked in um, Vicia faba, broad bean, uh, which was used to demonstrate DNA replication is also semi-conservative in eukaryotes. And so again, they use radioactivity, and they monitored the process of replication with labeled H3 thymidine and performed audio radi radiography. So this is um, a hydrogen isotope, and audiograph, audiography uh, pinpoints the location of a radioisotope in the cell. Um, so a photographic emulsion is placed over a cellular material and stored in the dark, and it develops almost like photographic film. So instead of light exposing the film, the radioactivity uh, exposes the film. And so the presence of a dark grain indicates the location of newly synthesized DNA. And so they looked at this, almost, it's almost like a karyotype when they looked at metaphase two cells. So this is, these are cells isolated from meiosis two. And so what they found um, was that only one of the uh, sister chromatids actually had the, uh, the radioactive dots associated with them. And so, you know, in some cases it was one, it was clearly distinguished between one sister chromatid and the other. And then in the other cases, you could also see um, uh, sister chromatid exchange um, where uh, there is actually um, exchange between the two DNA molecules. So this is not actually um, the same as recombination that normally occurs in, in the tetrad, where it's between homologous chromosomes, but this was actually able to show that sister chromatid, um, there is also genetic exchange in between different sister chromatids. And so you can see that because you would have this pattern where you'd have radioactivity and then switch back and forth between them. Okay, so these are the two key experiments that I expect you to know for understanding why DNA is semi-conservative.